So I will call the meeting to order at 7.01. Um, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? We do not need an executive session. Okay. We will strike the executive session number 14. Okay, any other adjustments? And we'll move to the consent agenda to approve the minutes of Tuesday, September 19th, 2023. Entertain a motion. The motion. Okay. Anyone? I'll second. Okay. Any discussion? And all in favor say aye. Sorry. Aye. Who initially motioned that? I'm sorry, I can't. I did. Ed. Peg did. Ed. Okay. Ed did. We don't have Peg yet. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Minutes are approved. Do we have any public comments at this time? All right. Then we'll move to board comments. Do we have any board comments? Chris. I should have mentioned, I thought I had a task force up here. Uh, uh, Building task force update on here, but we don't. Maybe we could take up that, or we could still add one if the board was okay under the policy committee. Okay. Right. Yeah, I didn't even see that. I was. No, I, I missed it. I just noticed. I just it. assumed seven okay. four when I looked at it was kind so of all, all all committees, but. And we do a task force <coughs> under under seven point five, the building task force update. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, any board comment? Then we'll on to the celebration of learning. Middle school flexible. All right. Conference. I had the honor of doing that this week. Ray, is it possible to present that? Thank you. So this month's celebration of learning is really focused on the flexible pathways and the learning opportunities that program presents here in the middle school. And I wanted to give you the where we're coming from. Next slide, please, Ray. So some of our guiding principles are addressed directly with flexible pathways, and these tend to drive a lot of the conversations when we're talking about curriculum or programmatic changes or ideas, specifically in flexible pathways. They're working very hard to build and maintain relationships relationships that uh, support, facilitate, foster uh, that love of learning. The intention is to have a student pursuing that which they want to know most about. Uh, in terms of citizenship, we do in that program stress learning from diverse perspectives. Uh, several student projects require people with differing opinions to work together and come up with a rational consensus before they present a project or a completed idea. Uh, and we are working very hard on uh, having students advocate for themselves, empowering them to take charge of their learning. Next one, please. Uh, clearly, scholarship is addressed there. Uh, the intention is to challenge them academically. Uh, projects are usually draft form the first time around, and there's a lot of input, uh, creativity added, more resources until they get to a finished product. Uh, excuse me, product. Uh, they are expected to reflect on the stages of their growth and be able to articulate at the end of a project or a unit or lesson um, how they've changed what they learned, how to change their world perspective, et cetera. Clearly, we're working on trying to build self-confidence and efficacy. Again, trying to build learners who are empowered to take control of their own education and really identify the things they're passionate about. And it is, in many cases, very highly individualized. Next slide, please, Ray simply a title. So what we're talking about is the White River Valley Middle School Hello, uh, Flexibles Pathway Program. I'll pause for just a moment to let Nancy settle because now we're getting nice. into the, the meat of that program. So what I brought to present to you in terms of ideas is not an exhaustive list, but it is um, some of the things that are actually going on in this first six-week rotation. 
Uh, students are not bound by a six-week rotation. Some of the students that I'll be mentioning tonight are, are in it for the long haul for the entire year. Try to divide these up into what are the facets of that program. First and foremost, it is an academic learning opportunity. Uh, and we have students that are pursuing a, a number of world languages. I had the pleasure and privilege of observing some students working on learning American Sign Language. Um, was able to communicate with them about a project going on in another school district where the students are reinterpreting common songs like from the movie Grease through ASL. So they're looking at not only just studying but applying and figuring out how to communicate with each other and others. Uh, we do have five students currently taking Algebra 1. Now that is through VTVLC, a program structured for self-directed learning but it is facilitated by a qualified individual who works directly with those students. So it's not five students trying to learn it algebra all on their own. There's a, a pretty significant focus on, good evening, a significant focus on STEM projects. Uh, two of the projects shown there. I'll pause for a small. <laughs> While Peg's sitting down, just uh, my curiosity, mm -hmm. how old are those five kids that are taking Algebra 1? Eighth graders. So how old? Still, still pretty early. Yeah? You're bringing um, into Algebra 1 at eighth grade. That's pretty sweet. They'll be... That's what my granddaughter's doing. That'll yeah. be pretty sweet for them when they try and go for the rest of their math if they oh, pass I, Algebra 1. I don't disagree. To, to put a plug in for work like the portrait of a graduate, Ideally, a student graduating from any high school, our high school in particular, the more of their trade experience or college experience they have under the belt, the better off they're going to be. Um, I'm driven by that and have been, and I'm glad this district recognizes that. Uh, turning back to the projects there, just two cherry picked from several that were there. Uh, the roller coaster project was a bit too large to include here. On the left you see uh, a physics experiment in looking at how crazy could a carnival ride be, I believe driven by recent experiences at the uh, World's Fair. On the right, uh, a prototype of a the moving parts of a Roomba, robotics, etc. Next one, please. There is a component that the work done should have some aspect of serving the community and Flexible Pathways has enabled some of the students to work in a variety of different spaces within the school, not at our direction, but by their request. Um, and some of these tie to much bigger ongoing projects. <clears throat> Clearly, a benefit to having a mentorship um, with elementary students. I want to point out the second one, a group of students that worked behind our amazing greenhouse here to weed out the tree nursery, start setting that space up again to reinvigorate it, have a, a growth season in the uh, spring. That particular organization, Regeneration Corps, will also be working with us as we expand, adding stone fruit trees, apple trees, more raised beds. Uh, a piece of that is how do we get from concept to actual food production and serving. So we're looking at uh, putting in an herb garden for the uh, kitchen so that our product can actually be used on our campus and in this community. <coughs> Excuse me. We have the benefit of a PE teacher here on our campus that teaches both middle and elementary <coughs> classes. So another perfect opportunity for a mentoring relationship. Uh, students can spend some time working as assistants in that PE class. It's a fairly popular choice. Um, the next one, please, Ray. Thank you very much. So at the end of it, what are the skills they're walking away with? How does that figure into how a flexible pathway is kind of guided? Uh, we are looking at a few examples here. Some of the students, again, at their request, a, a pretty popular option right now is working in the kitchen. That doesn't mean... Um, just working on the food service line. That means going in there and doing some of the actual prep work, learning knife skills, learning food safe ideas and criteria for food service industry. Um, much of what is prepared for our school has some middle school hand in it, washed and usually with a glove, just putting that out there. Um, 
tomorrow night we have our open house. An example of how that work in the food service portion of our school uh, is reflected through a lot, of, a lot of what we do. We will be, students will be preparing and serving apple crisp, apples donated by faculty and staff. Prepared, it will smell wonderful, it will cook <coughs> vanilla ice cream perfectly tomorrow. But that will be a, yet another example of a student product. Uh, through Bana and the Outdoor Ed program, looking at some, what I call, traditional Yankee skills. How we go from an apple to cider. What does that teach us about preservation? How does that teach us about the history of apple orchards in Vermont? Why is there an <coughs> apple tree on every abandoned farm? So learning about their history and connecting to it with hands-on experiments. And quite honestly, some of the most delicious apple cider I've had in a long time. I'd even put it up against Cold Hollow. Uh, tied to some ongoing work with the community, we have a number of beautiful new mountain bikes. Not only are students using them at, uh, during their break time, using them in an upcoming mountain biking trip. The students themselves through Flexible Pathways are learning some basic uh, bike safety, bike maintenance, working directly with people who essentially sold and maintain our bikes. Uh, so working with experts in the field. And again, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's an example of how a student may have a passion idea, a passion project. It's tied to what community resource can teach you more about that. How can we facilitate that learning either through an online platform or working with partners in other schools. I believe there's one more, right, please. So finishing there with the passion projects, for those students who are in a rotation, there comes a point where they've done the bulk of their project work. They've presented, they've had the feedback, they've made edits and corrections, they've worked with each other, and they have some time. I'm not going to say downtime, but they have time to more freely explore some things. And some of the things that have been taking place, designing and creating jewelry, fine metal skills. Uh, they're learning a lot of outdoor education skills, working directly with Bonna um, in her program. We have a host of students who are now walking around with chess boards. And they'll pull them out during break. They'll pull them out at lunch, before school. And so you'll see games taking place all over. And the last one is the one I want you to plant in the back of your brain. We're not at the point of me making this official pitch to you, but I think it's an excellent example of where students can take a passion project. Pygmy goats are really cute. We might agree with that, but it's not a totally convincing argument. A group of students took that, goats are cute, what's the value of them? What does it cost to maintain them? What kind of feed and housing do they need? Working with someone who actually raises livestock, what are the issues we're going to need to know about? What do we need to budget for veterinary maintenance? What are some common issues with these types of this specific breed of goat? And so about a half a dozen students had me sit down and hear a very thoughtful and cited presentation about why this school should have goats. And again, I'm not asking you for goats at this point. I think we'll have that conversation when we look at an overall improvement to the middle school area. But in terms of what that program, Flexible Pathways, can be proud of, it's that a student can take a passion idea, find others of a like, similar mind, work directly with their facilitator, teacher, outside experts, and produce a product that, um, frankly, they can come up with a rather compelling argument because they've thought through a lot of the details. It's not a simply I want kind of issue. It's a I think we should, let's learn more about, and what are the obstacles, what are the pieces we don't know about? What started as a passion project is now something we'll be discussing down the road in a grander scheme. So that, in a nutshell, is where Flexible Pathways is now. What I would leave with you with conceptually is, what can Flexible Pathways be? We have it, a program that is offering learning beyond the classroom walls, learning that is advanced for where a student would typically be. And you're right in pointing out Algebra 1 in eighth grade. That's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a student that came to us saying, I really want to know more about why was the US in wars? What's our history been? And is currently taking a US history course through VTVLC, again, on their own, technically, but with the facilitation of a teacher who's checking with them regularly, helping design projects and giving feedback on their work. So we can expand learning opportunities.
we can expand how they see their value in the community and what they can offer in return and tie into a lot of the pieces that this community has going on for it. Collaboration with the people who are supporting the mountain biking, architectural design of what a playground could look like, putting hands on physics projects as opposed to looking at simply equations and working through force and velocity. Um, bringing some play back to their fun, or fun back to their learning. Any questions for clarity? Um, I guess, how is this working into the student schedule? Like, when is this happening and? So it depends on the student. Um, for some, for example, the ones who are taking their math course through that flexible pathways, uh, that is replacing their the majority of their in-class time, their seat time in uh, Ms. Wimette's class, for example. Other, in other situations, as part of the essentials rotation, specifically in the sixth grade, they do a six-week rotation. So uh, Andy West, running that program, uses that time to get them used to the rhythm, the development from idea to project concept to presentation. So they're, in a sense, trained early on in sixth grade, and then other students can access that through other essentials time in that rotation during intervention and extension time, specifically on like a Friday, where we have any number of um, intervention and extensions happening for all of the students. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, Jamie. I'm up. How's everyone tonight? Good? Um, so you have my report in hand. Um, one of the things I wanted to uh, highlight is, is that, you know, we, this organization had gone through a, a, a lot of work around Act 46 around merging. And so not only did we merge two supervisory units together, we merged multiple districts. And I would say that you know, there's been a, and then we had COVID hit. Um, and so, you know, we, I would say really the last two years, we've been able to really get to work around a significant focus on instructional leadership and in improving academic outcomes. And, you know, one of the things I think that really provides evidence of that um, is a lot of information within your principal's report that they keep reporting out on but uh, the work that we've done to improve our curricular documents. And so I put a link in, the, in my board report that I, I really encourage the board to go visit. Uh, we set out to make certain we had curricular documents in all the content areas across all the different grade levels so that we could clearly articulate to families, actually all stakeholders, what we want our kids to know, understand, and do. Uh, and our teachers worked with the agency of ed uh, and then with Onda Adams and Michaela Martin out of the SU office um, to create documents that I'm really proud of and that I think are going to serve us really well in regards to how we look to continue to improve student outcomes. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight that that links in my report. Um, you'll note that a couple uh, content areas are not quite finished yet, but I want to remind you we moved to an SU-wide report card that are aligned to these indicators and outcomes. We're going to be moving to a middle school report card, too, across the SU to ensure that we're reporting out on what we want our kids to know, understand, and do. Um, and so that's, that's really uh, exciting work, and I'm, I'm really pleased that we're at that place. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight that, and then I will entertain any questions folks may have. Please note uh, that there's uh, a thought that week of the 30th right now, we do not have any board meetings scheduled across the SU. Um, and so that could be possibly an opportunity for us to hold that full board retreat um, that we had to cancel last week because we were looking a little thin um, on attendance. So we'll take that up next Tuesday. Um, but if you look at the, your calendars and, and now already know, like, boy, Monday's the best, if you could email that to Kathy and I, Kathy Galuzzo and I, that would be great because then we'll try to, to hone in on a, two, a couple of dates to propose next week. Does anybody have any questions from the superintendent report? No. 
Okay. Then we'll move to the principal's report. Thank you, Jamie. Yep. Maybe we should go in reverse because we can then sure. segue right into the academic data that you don't have to report out. Sure. So uh, first off, I'd like to just talk about the data. So we started our fast bridge assessment uh, recently for the ninth and 10th grade. We just haven't had our data teams to be able to get that information, so there's nothing to bring forward tonight. And then our uh, 10th and 11th graders took the PSATs just recently. Um, in the report, just wanted to highlight the CBL program. It's really stepped up this year. I'm really excited. Some of the things that uh, Jeff Clayton's doing is the waste water treatment program, veterinary work. We're working on commercial uh, drone pilot licenses for some of the students. First responders in emergency management went to uh, take a class just recently. And then uh, several science students went to work with the UVM uh, program at Lake Champlain. So some really exciting stuff going on. Um, lastly, building community, which is really important, I think, in our schools. And uh, we had our open house, which was a big success. Always, I love that first open house we have, and with a concert. <coughs> and, you know, we're the first concert in the state, because most, you know, concerts and bands aren't ready, but we step up and get it done. It's pretty cool. Um, and this year was kind of neat. They kind of sort of showed what they do in a typical class. And that was really interesting to see them warm up. Like athletes would warm up before a game. And uh, both uh, Joshua and Amber Levitt did a great job. Um, and then we had a, our outing day, um, several different events that took place on last Friday. And then just recently, senior games. And um, yesterday uh, I, I was unable to make the building meeting because uh, Mr. Canary said I could go to the senior game because it's kind of important for our kids to go. And then tonight we had a faculty meeting, so I got to go to our boys game. So get to see the senior games. So good community stuff. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, what I would highlight, I and mean, I've already talked about flexible pathways, uh, our middle school open house is tomorrow night from 5.30 to 6.30. It is really a celebration of what the students have been doing. They're going to have many of their own projects on display. We'll have fresh cider, things that they've cooked, the bikes that they're maintaining, some of the various things that are going on. So uh, again, looking for ways to engage the community. The only other thing I would highlight is um, with a lot of support from central office, which I greatly appreciate, we have now nearly completed the first cycle of a data inquiry um, cycle, really trying to foster that culture of curiosity, as Jamie has put it. Uh, we've looked at all of our current targeted plans. We've identified the ones that need updating, ones that need to be reinforced. We found pieces that have necessarily uh, drop by the wayside. Certain student plans are now back in place. In other words, we've put it in writing. We now have them in place and students are receiving appropriate interventions. We then went a step further looking at um, a whole host of academic data to look at, <clears throat> well, what are the other areas we can support students? And specifically tied to all of this work is a question we'll refer to in a moment. How does this work inform our universal instruction? How can we provide supports for a greater number of people? Um, and coming up very soon will be a report out from a team working purely on the social emotional data. You can call it behavioral data, looking at what are the hot spots, hot spaces, transition points, behaviors we're dealing with the most, so we can start targeting specific uh, proactive interventions as opposed to merely reacting to behaviors. Uh, and so in terms of our data, that's the cycle we are now in and growing up talking to and learning some lessons from my partner in the elementary school. And with that. I think the thing I want to highlight the most about um, this principal report isn't something you can actually read in the principal report, but it is that um, our leadership team really helped fill this in this week. Um, and I was, I was away. And so that was really helpful. And I feel like this is really comes from our whole elementary because it was really coming from the whole leadership team. Uh, I think the section I'm most proud of, just because <laughs> I remember it was so hard to engage community not so long ago, but is really our community engagement section. So we had our open house. It was lovely. Thank you for all who did get to attend at both campuses. It was lovely to have Health Hub present, have our farm school coordinator uh, starting her job. 
and uh, I'm just proud to have the fire departments both working with us to come in and do fire education, have um, Barn Arts reaching out to us about really wonderful enrichment opportunities again to offer our elementary kids. Uh, and yeah, and just all the, all the good things to be connected to our community with. Uh, and mostly we're gearing up for conferences now. So that's, that's where we're at. I know there's a lot more in here too, but I'm happy to answer questions about that. Uh, but we are happy to now report out though on the academic report, which there's hard copies at the end if you didn't get one. Um, and so on Friday, our half day, the elementary crunched this data with Onda Adams and um, Michaela Martin. Uh, and really went through, for elementary we went through uh, in small different groups this process of looking about what are things to celebrate from the data, what are we wondering about, what are implications um, for our practice, and then next steps and anything else. So I think what I'd love to report out is on that and in conjunction with um, Pierre who did that with his staff at the mm -hmm. staff meeting. So we'll just kick it off with celebrations because I think there's actually a lot to celebrate and we're really proud of. K-2 test scores show growth, so the percentage of kids in the red, which is not what you want, is less than 10%. In elementary as a cohort, the math levels are improving. As a group, each elementary grade has made progress from the fall of 22-23 to 23-24. Uh, and then I'll even, let's keep on going with celebrations. Mm -hmm. so middle school, the eighth grade math made more progress than had been expected. And middle school reading and French groups are beginning with more uh, advanced skills than in previous years. So, some growth there. We were going to tag team this. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> tag. <laughs> <coughs> That's fine. Um, so, we phrase this as wonderings or wonderments, um, the kind of curiosity questions one needs to ask when looking at a data set. Um, so, some of the wonderments. Uh, why are we not seeing as much growth in the language arts in the elementary school? Uh, that, I'll leave it there. Um, looking at specific cohorts, that might you might see a drop off in how many are proficient in a certain area. Start asking the kinds of questions, what accounts for that? You start getting beyond the just, oh well, COVID caused. You get to more specific areas of instruction or what interventions were used, how things can be improved as opposed to being mired in things you can't change in the past, if that makes sense. Um, the question did come up though, how did COVID affect this data set? Uh, this is a new type of assessment following a year of a state assessment. We know where we've been in the last few years and we are routinely asking the question, how does our data reflect potential um, missed learning opportunities, lost learning. So again, going back to the celebration of there was an ex expectation uh, in particular grades, we would see a certain amount of progress, X amount of progress, and we saw X plus. So we're actually seeing more than we expected. But again, even a positive, even a celebration, one should be asking the question, well, what accounts for that? If we're doing something well, how can we generalize it, repeat it, support it, strengthen it? Um, we are kind of curious why our proficiency bands are higher, slightly higher to higher than the national average. Again, asking a question of a good thing can lead to what skills we're teaching directly, the scope and sequence of how a curricular arc falls across a year. So we're again in that culture of curiosity, asking questions not just how do we fix what's quote unquote wrong or broken, but how do we improve and continually improve upon what is going well. Um, jump into universal instruction? Yeah, okay. so this is actually like a, a merger of three different things. It's the so now what. So uh, mm -hmm. I will say that we, this, this is not our end of looking at the data. We looked at it kind of as, as a big cohort, and then uh, we'll be working in smaller grades and at targeted teams to dig into uh, what do we need to do universally. And so see, these were like a, a bunch of, you know, bunch of suggestions that kind of come, came out of a bunch of, um, of everybody just looking at what we can do next. So uh, there was a lot of question about word problems, if that was what was holding up some of our math scores, and maybe if we should teach better problem solving skills around word problems. Uh, talked about conventions practice daily and regrouping practice specifically in elementary. 
uh, we talked about really digging into the categories where students scored lowest and finding specific supplemental work that goes along with that. Uh, vocabulary practice was one of those things to find supplemental work in. Uh, and then there was a conversation also about talking to um, upper elementary students about their scores and about what they need to work on and, and really making sure that they own it. Um, I know that goes right along with our student-led conferences anyways, um, but that was a conversation that's had as well. Um, and I think these were more middle school, but they'd love to dig into the data more, mm -hmm. which I know they're going to, compile a list and a set of accessible cross-curricular nuggets. Um, yeah, actually add to that you one. can because I wasn't there for that one. Thinking back to earlier uh, principal reports I've submitted for you folks and things I've said out loud, some of the work we saw we made time, time and space for over the summer working between departments, that has already led to some anecdotal gains. Students that are showing um, understanding a concept introduced in a mentor book and then generalizing that to how does that apply to much more difficult text or how does that apply to a concept, a, a social construct or a government. What they're noticing is, hey, well, if, if we're experiencing that has rewards, how can we start looking at the data that would support that and drive a practice that makes that a regular routine? How can I, as a science teacher, work with my partner, Jeff, an ELA <coughs> teacher, to remove the obstacle that vocabulary might present. How can he support what I'm doing? How can my concepts support the flow of literacy? We're noticing those conversations are taking place more and more, and through this cycle of data, they're asking, well, where's the data to support this? So they're starting to change from the anecdotal to the data-driven. So, uh, I don't point this out as a positive or negative or even purely neutral, but it's something to bear in mind. Uh, I think many of us in this room have likely heard the phrase teaching to the test. It's what we don't want to do. We don't want to prepare our children to just take a standardized assessment. But the question was asked, if we're using this particular benchmark early on and it shows areas our students have not been trained or educated in yet, how do we adjust our teaching so that in terms of the sequence of the year, they're getting to that content earlier without jeopardizing kind of a foundational understanding? So it's trying to find that balance between not wanting to teach to a standardized assessment, but having an intentionality that matches where our benchmarks are going to be so the data is more reflective of what they're learning and less reflective of, well, they just haven't learned that yet. Make sense? Along those lines, how um, have we looked at, you know, we have the curricular documents at this point, like how well those correlate to what is being tested? Um, like, do you guys have a sense for how well those match? It's funny, today's staff meeting we were working on math, it's not funny, and we were looking at the any unit assessments, and that was what was brought up was the, right now our math program aligns with Common Core and how we should fold into um, fold into that our proficiencies so we can know that alignment better. So that was, it's, I think it's the next step to talk about examples and things like that. So I don't know if we have that dialed in as much, but we're, those conversations are happening right now. Yeah. I would concur or <clears throat> echo. Um, I think that's the work, not that we're turning to now like it hasn't been done before. I'm not pretending that, but people are having similar realizations of how do these different guiding documents or our senses uh, coincide. So again, finding that balance of we don't want to teach to a benchmark. The benchmark should be an assessment of where a student is, the snapshot to help inform instruction and interventions potentially. Um, I'm encouraged that a lot of the conversations are turning more and more into how do we prove what we know so that we can better get to a point where students can show mastery and show proficiency, and how, to, how does that align to something that might function like that as an assessment tool. So it's trying to find a way to make it authentic, realistic, and match where our students are. Do, do we feel on the math side of it, because you know, last year at this time we were talking about some of our 
um, deficiencies in, on the math testing. And granted, you know, some kids do better towards the test. And, you know, is that really the how much they understand or know? Um, but ha how do we feel right now looking at, I mean, it, it still shows that we're deficient when it comes into the middle school on the mathematics end of things, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. Um, so do we feel that what we put into place last fall is working or do we need to do more to, to get those, that group was kind of more, you know, we had um, <clears throat> targeted that group as having issues coming out of COVID mm -hmm. and we, we put more resources and more time into trying to get their proficiencies higher. So I guess, you know, the, the, the testing here shows that they're still deficient. So do we feel that what we're doing is going to get them to where we want to go or do we need to adjust that for this year? So qualifying my answer as I'm familiar with what I've become aware of since I started. So if I misspeak, I apologize. What I have noticed is the assessment data, the conversations they were having prior to the beginning of the school year informed their instruction directly. I have two uh, brilliant math teachers on my side of the school here, um, not to impugn yours, just speaking of mine. Uh, and they, they meet weekly. And I think you use the word adjust. I think they're constantly adjusting where they are. They have the curricular arc. They have the roadmap of where they want to go conceptually, the um, specific foundational skills they need to work in. Um, and the adjustment may be how long they might spend in, in whole group instruction on a particular concept, uh, assessing when they're ready to move on, either through an assessment or, again, anecdotally. I think where you're seeing probably, or you would see more of the continual improvement kind of response is how we're targeting very specific research-based programs for math intervention and working very hard to make sure that that's what our interventionist is using with students, uh, looking at the model, a push-in versus pull-out model. So the adjustment happens on two ends. How do we adjust the flow of the whole group instruction, the universal instruction, and how are we targeting very specific skills in the interventions? How are we supporting that interventionist to do the best work in, again, a research-based program? Um, what I've seen is a great deal of support from central office. I know today, as a matter of fact, my interventionist was meeting with Bonnie uh, to go over this math intervention program that they're continuing to build. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I think for the most of it, I mean, it, you know, I... So <clears throat> again, the, the students are making progress, and that is mm -hmm. encouraging. I believe lends very much the sense that we're on the right path. And by having those constant conversations, continual conversations about what did this week's intervention data look like? Mm -hmm. um, are, are our plans for intervention aligning to what the student needs are? How do we know what we're saying? Mm -hmm. And we're turning back to uh, routine data collection and again using a research-based program for intervention is what we're driving towards. So I know the goal was last year, you know, we targeted the 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, and it was more how do we get the 6th and 7th graders on target to be ready for high school, mm -hmm. um, obviously, and then give, give as much extra help to the 8th graders. Have Jeff, have we seen the 8th graders transition over to ninth grader? Have we seen any? I know it's early on, but are we right. seeing any of those deficiencies that are carried over because you know, we only had less than a year to make adjustments for them. And in this eighth grade, it represented this data set, sorry to jump in, yeah. is his current ninth grade. No, 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 no. no. This is no. the current eighth grade yeah. in yeah. the fall. And it was just oh, I, I but you said you, yeah, you have some testing that you're looking at. Yeah. Assessment, so we're looking at that. But we have some, <clears> you know, our fourth count. period That's there really is a period where a lot of those students get extra support. That's been helpful. You're thinking about the state. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. yeah. I apologize. Sorry. We're looking at that data too. Because I looked at that <laughs> data recently. <laughs> yeah, we data. just sent that out. I mean, I'll jump in. I, you know, I think in general across the SU, Sorry, no. what I'm feeling good about, and you'll see it in our SU data, is that our primary grades are showing that we are continuing to be above the the percentile that we've set. And so that one question around why are we higher? We have set. Our, our proficiency bandwidth 
the percentile higher to align with Vermont and New England standards. So we are assessing our kids at a higher level than the national norm standards to try to be a better predictor of how our students will be able to perform on the state assessment. Um, and so what I'm encouraged by, uh, Chris, is that if you look at our primary grades, mm -hmm. that our kindergarten, like, we are continuing to maintain momentum in math around K to one to two. I don't, that, that I believe is the work that we're doing to strengthen our math instruction at those primary grades. Mm -hmm. It is, while we also have to continue to work on making some more gap filling for our middle school kids, right? And so right. the long game is, is that we're ensuring our kids have really strong mathematical foundational skills at the elementary level. You know, I would tell you those middle school data sets, and Nancy can speak to this way better than I because she was a middle school math teacher, but I would say that those skills really started to break down in the upper elementary. So the students that we see struggling at the middle school level, it probably started around fractional reasoning and decimals and percents, and then it's sort of built from there. And so the key for us is, and it's what Pierre kept talking about, is how do we universally make certain we're spending time to gap fill those mm -hmm. deficits with the understanding that maybe not every student needed it, but it's probably good to review so that we have auto automaticity effects. So mm -hmm. that's the work that's happening, not just here, but across our middle schools. You know, the, the good news is, is that we have our teachers coming together as professional learning uh, communities to learn from each other across the SU. So your middle school teachers are gonna be meeting with middle school teachers at First Branch and at Newton to look at you know, what's working, what's not working, how do we learn from each other um, so that we continue to, to try to build and gain momentum here. I mean, the other thing is, and I wanna put a real shout out to your faculty is, they really did change their schedule. And the good news is, I mean, that didn't take effect until after the first of last year, but we did gain significant minutes in your middle school schedule to explicitly work on these content areas around math and literacy. So mm -hmm. I think the goal is, is that this is our baseline for this year and we're gonna to continue to see good gains throughout the year. Yep. Yeah, and the seventh and eighth grade, like it does show, you know, above- We're making line, gains, so, yeah. yeah, we're making gains. The sixth grade number is concerning and you know, whether it's something in the transition between fifth grade and sixth grade or something we're doing in fifth grade, it does seem like that needs some attention. <laughs> Sometimes it's just a cohort. Yeah, could be the cohort. <laughs> um, you know, I would say too, and a real shout out to the elementary school, and I think this is gonna help us, is that you do have content specialty happening at your elementary schools now in the upper elementary. Right. Meaning a teacher that's focusing in math and a teacher that's focusing in English language arts. And um, I think that's going to really benefit us. I think we're, you can speak we're to that more. Intervention to that same thing too. So, like, an interventionist is just doing math, and then one interventionist is just doing literacy versus trying to do it all um, right. to really focus does, on their skills. Does the interventionist they always just work with one student, or do they no, take small groups, groups out? Okay, small groups. Generally, I mean, I'm not going to say there isn't one or two that need one on one, but. Right. We try to do small groups. And like at the middle school, you said the middle school teachers meet with each other. Do they ever go down and meet with the elementary classes, teachers, to see where the students are coming from? We do that part of the transition process, but I wouldn't say we do it during the school year probably as much. But there is a couple meetings at the end of the year before they transition, yes. And the high school too, to middle school. I mean, yeah. you see where your students are coming from and where they are. So you kind of prepare for it. But We've had ha we have had some vertical teaming meetings already, and I imagine that's going to continue throughout the year. Um, yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I do like this report, and it is provides some interesting data. Um, as we continue on with this assessment, it'd be great to like kind of link back to other reports so we kind of get a longer term story and so we can get see like well yeah that cohort has trouble or you know there is a consistent something happening in this particular part you know like so that's what i would like to see at some point is somewhere to kind of link it towards 
an overall arc of how we're doing and what's noise and what's signal, you know. Yeah, it, it, Sharon tonight, we, that they've used it three years, so you could get even a better picture. This is only year two for us here with Track My Progress, but we're going to continue to build on it. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to switch it so that you said we can get that arc. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just excited because when some, every once in a while, now teachers are like graphing their own end of unit assessments, and and like you walk in and they, oh, this is what the end of unit assessment looked like, and they're like showing me pictures of how everyone's doing. I'm like, this is amazing. Like people are digging in on their own. So, mm -hmm. good. Okay. It is exciting. No, I do feel like we are finally have the ball, like a snowball. Uh, around momentum, around data in the SU. Like it has, the, I do think we are starting to gain some momentum around being, how do you use data as a way to celebrate and to inform our work and not seen as something that we like, it's a negative, right? Like I would say to you four years ago, I really, and principals can correct me if Andrew was here with me, I really feel like the word was seen as bad. I mean, I remember interviewing here in touring buildings and one of the questions teachers had for me was like are you a data person and i was like yes <laughs> and i don't know if that was necessarily seen as positive right like but i was like all right we got some work to do here but it was really seen as like not used as a tool more like it was just seen in the negative context so i do feel like we're building a building momentum all right does anybody have any anything further for the principals or about the data report Right. Sarah. You all have my report. Outlines what's happening in the business office in the month of October. Only update I have since issuing the report last week is the audit has continued and extended into this week, so our auditors are still here. And if there's any questions. And it's going great, by the way. Do you have an estimate for when that'll be? They were, they're going in alphabetical order and they were into Sharon today. Okay. Well, now we fully expect that we'll have them back. Oh, yeah, we're still on time, yeah. yeah, target time. It just, because they're new and, you know, we're yeah. seven entities, it took a little bit in the first couple to, like, get the like, way <laughs> we set up and, you know, to get familiar with it all, so. And then they had some, they had a couple of days where they had some sicknesses, so they had to postpone so. All right. Uh, policy committee. You want to go, Ron? Uh, you want me to go? No, you go ahead. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't met since the last meeting, have we? We did, but we. Um, so what we've done is the policy committee is um, we're going to be reviewing every policy over hopefully the next eighteen months. We're going to be looking at bringing boards. Uh, for possible um, revisions to policies. And so one of the things I'm working on prior to the policy committee next Tuesday is helping the, the policy committee see like what policies do we have in the books right now that were adopted prior to uh, VSBA required um, and revised policies having happened. So meaning Let's say we have a policy in place that we, we implemented in, in 18, it's required, and the VSBA revised it in 20, crosswalking our 18 policy with the 20 policy and making revisions based on the model policy and or changes we may want to make. Um, and so that's the work that's going to be happening in the policy committee. So my sense is you're going to start to see probably every month policies coming up with uh, possible revisions as that group's doing their review. So how many total do you think we're talking about? Like, Well, uh, Ray, do you remember when we created that document, how many policies we have? I mean, I was say 50. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was going to say so that's really not 50 that to 60. No. no, and we'll only take up a few, <coughs> I'm thinking three to five each meeting and, we'll, and the board member, the policy committee will have them ahead of time and we'll make notes and then we'll meet about them. But, you know, I'm hoping that we can accomplish this in the next year and a half that we'll have reviewed each policy. Um, would it make sense to publish kind of the schedule so that people can provide feedback on 
Thank you know that I, that's good. It's a good, it's a working document that I can share out with the whole board. It's just we haven't settled on it yet. But once we have it, yeah, absolutely. Good. It's hyperlinked. It's actually a really nice um, spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. I'm a table guy. All right. But Ray helped me with a spreadsheet, so I'm feeling <laughs> more tech savvy, and I think it's going to serve us well. It was a big joke in the policy committee. Uh, building task force update. Yeah, so <clears throat> ours is you know quite, actually been quite busy. We just met yesterday, um, so you know some of the pieces that we were going over first was was uh, the ongoing work in the buildings. <clears throat> so the the Bethel campus. Um, there's hopes of having both of the wood chip boiler pieces here and installed by the end of November. Um, so that's kind of the target time right now. Everything else is is been done um, or ordered. They're still waiting for a few things to come in. But um, seems like that that December timeline should they should hit that last you know last we talked. It's on a it's on a boat getting mm -hmm. ready to be offloaded. So as long as it gets through customs and stuff quickly then we'll be be good there. Um, I, I didn't catch up with them too much. They're working. They're, they're a little behind on the lighting piece of it, so they're um, they're kind of falling behind. It sounded like the contractor they were using was shorthanded, and they've fallen behind a little bit. So they're still. Um, they kind of reassured us that they were going to up the manpower to to get the lighting completed in the Royalton campus, and then they were moving over to here. Um, and, and they're working in Sharon or somewhere else still too. Yeah, so I mean they, they're doing every building, but right now they just have one crew. The goal is that they're going to be up to two or three. Yeah. So, um, I EI has told me that they're going to have it, like that. The subcontractor, their deadline date is by de December first. Mm -hmm. So, the, the so contractor really needs to figure it out. Yeah. But, yeah. So I mean I think for the most part we're we're pretty good. The lighting end of it we're falling behind a little bit, but but. Um, I think but Royalton has some of theirs, though, right? They do. They're over half done. Yeah. 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 And they like them. Yeah. From what I heard. They're lovely. Yep. Uh, is the propane furnace running? Yes. Yeah. 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 LP part all is all working. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they're finishing up. I don't know what do you say. This week did finish up the um, the wood chip silo, or next week, um, and then they're just waiting for the boilers to come. So. Um, the uh, we also talked about. Um, the entrance and security and energy efficiency of those um, entrances that we had talked about before. Um, so there's the, the two entrances here um, at the middle school and elementary school, as well as the back, and we'll call back entrance to the high school. So we we have um, um, we've gone through some uh, you know not really detailed um, assessments of those and and started to kind of throw around. A ballpark on how much that would be for all of it, um, and um, and they will be looking into the um, there's a a grant through the U.S. Department of Justice that has up to a half million dollars that they award for different grants to use towards security at schools. So this would qualify, and he was going to look into that and see about um, it would probably be something that we would be in line for. If I read it right, they. They do like June, they're June grant, so it wouldn't be anything until next June at the earliest. So um, there, are, there are 75, 25 um, grants, so we would have to come up with 25% of it. And uh, rough estimates, anyways, right now we're kicking around for all three entrances to be upgraded or somewhere around $600,000. So it sounds like the grant would cover, you know, uh, most of it. And, you know, we'd be on the hook for maybe 100,000 of it. So um, that, as we all came in through, you know this door here isn't on it but as you can see you know we do have some challenges at some uh, some of our doors in our schools so we also were talking about um, uh, putting in an assessment um, for both the schools when it came to the doors we obviously know there's windows and other things we'd like to get to as well um, which we are going to develop a, um, a, a schedule of that we can use for timeline for five to ten year projects at school um, you know, non-bonded type projects that upgrade windows, upgrade, you know, these things so that we can bring to our, our yearly budget and, and so that we'd have a better handle on what money we need to put aside um, each year to do that. So we're going to work on that. The, um, 
we also talked about the arts and music expansion, um, possible expansion project that we had talked about as a group uh, a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. So right now, um, at least on our end, um, the project seems to be moving forward faster than we anticipated. So there's been um, several donors that have come forward. Um, we had kicked it around here at the school board that you know, in order to go to the voters for money for an expansion that we probably want to see some sort of uh, donor money that would be attached to that. And we had thrown out possibly a third third donor match with two thirds of a, of a school match type deal to at least get the conversation and, and see where that would lead. It sounds like right now that, that we have or will have the donor match set for this project. Um, and we were just kind of kicking around the numbers of the project somewhere in the three million dollar area. So they've they've come up with you know, or can or will come up with about a million dollars with the donor match, which is which is amazing. Um, <laughs> so so what we wanted to propose this evening was um, well two things: a timeline um, of of kind of how we see this going, but also um, what we'd like to do is be able to move forward with the project mm -hmm. in the in the sense of now can we start to look at what would two thirds of, of that look on a bond. So um, you know we've we've figured out how we come up with a third of this project. So what would that two thirds look like financially <coughs> for us? Um, how would that look like on a bond note for whatever, 10, 15, 20 years or however we do it, so that we can start the next piece of it to say can we afford it or or start putting the data together of this is how much we would have to bond, this is what the effect would be on it. Um, the kind of we were trying to put together a timeline. Um, the timeline that we're kind of looking at right now would be um, in November, if we could, would be able to have some of a, a very preliminary um, bond numbers on this is kind of what we're looking at on the two thirds end. Um, if if we agree or that seems sort of reasonable on the November uh, meeting, we'd like to schedule in Eric to do some uh, presentation in December to go through of what this facility kind of would look like. I know we kind of briefly talked about it before, but a little more let's revise ourselves and what that might look like and maybe some of the timelines of what that could look like. Um, and if that went well, you know, at that point, we'd be looking to get a board commitment in the January, February time frame of uh, that we have a commitment to go forward with the project. And then the idea that we were coming up with a committee would be to to go for a bond vote in November. Um, it's we don't really have enough time to get a bond vote together before um, before March. Um, but also, you usually have better voter turnout um, on a presidential election. So we have November coming up so uh, that was kind of our our timeline that we're looking at right now but um, we were pretty surprised that uh, you know we do have some donors lined up and yeah that's great um, you know we cannot you know these are dreams that we've always had right and uh, you know <coughs> we're also just kicking around some numbers myself and you know if we really look at a project like this I mean let's let's say it, let's say it attracts half a dozen students a year you know you know, a half a dozen students a year at whatever eighteen thousand dollars a year, I mean, just, and if that happens every year, I mean, the project almost pays itself off in twelve years, right? I mean, it's it's kind of a it's a project that's going to pay itself off even if you have to borrow some money to do it. Um, and I mean, how many schools in the area actually have a a nice music and arts facility that they can you know advertise and really put the work so I think that I would think it would be added to the high school on you know so far we're doing kind of a really good job of promoting the athletic department right and we've talked about that the arts is this last piece to go with the academics and art and athletics that we need to be able to attract all the students that we can so um, so I guess what you know I I guess with the what, what I'd kind of like to know through the board is do we feel at this time you know, now that um, that the arts and music department has um, done most of the heavy lifting at this point, and they've gone out and they found they found um, you know a donor that has already um, 
going to put down a substantial amount of money, and then there's other donors that they have talked to or are in the process of talking to that are also <coughs> um, very interested in doing likewise. So, um, so do we feel good as a, a collective group of we've kind of and we kind of told them before like if we want to get this thing off the ground, we're going to need some backing from the community, and we threw out a third. And now that they've kind of said we feel pretty confident about this third, do we feel confident as a board of moving forward on, you know, working with the business manager to figure out what would that two-third look like and, you know, how would we afford that and what would that bond look like? I think we owe them our best shot. I think it sounds fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I'm very excited about this project and everything. Um, what we discussed about one of the things about maybe doing at the board retreat was looking at this kind of stuff holistically. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it would be great to kind of have an idea of the arts and music and how much that is and what the timeline of that is, plus like entrances, but also kind of the putting that in with the five-year plan, whatever we kind of have. I know we don't have it all right now, but kind of having the holistic look of this is what we'd like to do facilities-wise and kind of expand on that a little bit more at our retreat to get a, as good an idea of what we can, as we can mm -hmm. for that. Um, <clears throat> so I don't, I mean, I, we can certainly kind of get a sense of where people are at right now on this, but also kind of maybe think about just like having a extended discussion about it with everything kind of laid out. I mean, you did a great job of kind of summarizing a lot of it right there anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, the other the other piece that I guess it would depend on, I mean, we, we do feel as a, a committee that the, the entrance security at our schools is very important. And, you know, um, so we're in hopes that we would be able to come away with a Department of Justice um, grant. Yeah, so, we do that for 150 months. Um, <laughs> so we feel confident with that, but we also were talking about is what if we don't get the grant we also feel that that is a project that should move forward. So at that time, our thoughts were, if we didn't get the grant for that or didn't look like we would get it and we wanted to move forward, would we include the entrance security uh, piece of it into the bond with the arts and music center? Um, as it certainly the, makes sense to do them at the same time. Like yeah. it's the same. Well, for instance, the, the high school one we talked about that <clears throat> you know the high school one we would probably wait you know if if this was successful you do it all at the same time because it's all going to go right in the same area um yeah, for the most part in you know we talked about that the the middle school uh, not to get into too much detail but the the middle school entrance would would be completely revamped so there would be an exterior um shell you know so if you pretty much where the the roof comes out that would be where the new exterior doors would be. The interior doors and windows would likely be replaced as well because they're just, they're old, they're not efficient. Um, they're not, I mean, the door slams and you're just wondering if the glass is gonna break, right? Um, the, the elementary piece of it actually is in good shape. So we were just talking about maybe some reconfiguring there, updating some of the um, entry um, security um, there were some questions about do we keep the kindergarten door? Is that really something that needs to be there because they already have other egresses? Um, you know, how would we lock the cafeteria door during the daytime and that interior door? So those were kind of things. Not as much money I don't think will be spent there, but then you have the the back part of the high school which you would have to build a shell outside, <clears throat> you know, that would encompass that. But if we were able to be successful, the with the new wing, then we would build that all as one um, type deal. So, but uh, yeah, so we've been pretty busy. Yeah, <laughs> great work. Um, so yeah, should we kind of everybody take this information, think about it over the next couple of days, and we'll pick this up at the uh, the board retreat. And maybe we can come up with a way of kind of get a document where we kind of summarize some of the stuff with the timelines and sure. whatnot. That would be great. Plus, I mean, we could put in like, yeah, what bonds would be, what our um, 
you know, we've got our reserve funds as well on how much money do we want to take from reserve funds for these type of projects. And so but I think looking at it as a whole would be great. And yeah, thanks for all your work on that. And I think we would also, you know, likely this would be kind of a, most likely be a 2025 type project. You know, does that sound about right that we were talking about 2025 by the time permits and, you know, you get through the whole roll of it. Yeah. <laughs> so nothing goes quick. No, not at all. <laughs> Although the the bonds certainly would have looked better a couple of years ago. Well, <laughs> like, uh, well, actually, believe it or not, we we were joking about that, and um, Eric had mentioned that the bond bank rates haven't raised as as oh, yeah. not as quickly as. As consistent as with with the private banks, I think okay. he said, I don't know, three percent he threw out right now, um, <laughs> something like that. So, <laughs> but all right, okay. Um, so W W R U D Finance Task Force is down a member. Um, Louise Ferrisburg retired after right. a couple of years of service with us, so we are looking for community member involvement. So if anybody knows any community members, we should outreach and see if there's anyone interested in joining our finance <coughs> committee. How good do they have to be with numbers? They don't have to be good with numbers at all. No? Okay. No. When do you typically meet? The second Thursday at noon. You said noon? virtual and I mostly were you know review the warrants kind of talk about some overall big picture things but you know just keeping on top of things you know. yeah. any questions come up you know, that yeah. type of thing. and they would be joining Jeff Andrew myself and Peggy it's the current finance committee All right, you missed so. the fun. We'll have to have that on the agenda again next building. month. <laughs> mm -hmm. You missed the fun building one. Yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds good. Um, policy adoption. Um, first one we'll look at is act to adopt A20, Board Civility and Code of Ethics Policy. This was adopted by the SU Board last meeting. Right? Yep. Yeah. So. We're looking to adopt it for our district now. Actually, you guys might be the last ones. Yep, Sharon just, just adopted it, so you'd be the last ones. So I entertain a motion to adopt. So moved. This policy. Seconded. Okay, does anybody have any discussion? I mean, other than to say there's nothing in here that I don't expect from myself and others, it's. There was no there was no curveballs when when I read this. So. Okay. All right. All in favor of adapting policy A two thirty, say aye. 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 Okay. Um. All right. Policy A two thirty is adopted. Um. And I don't think she meant to do that. Oh, Peggy had her hand up. Oh, did you have something to say, Peggy? I just said, I, my, I mean, my eye still stands, but I, there was just one grammatical thing that really bothered me that yeah. just needs, and it's absolutely being extremely picky, but in the first paragraph, one, two, three, four, fifth line, it says, uh, you know, White River Valley Supervisory Union and its member districts, school board members, there theoretically should be an apostrophe after school districts. Member districts. True. We can do that, and it's not going to affect it. <laughs> what? Right. It, I, it has no effect, but it makes it proper, I'm afraid. Thank you. Thank you. I can't, I, I couldn't hold back. I'm sorry. <laughs> This has had a lot of attorneys' eyes on it, too. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, so next we'll I'll entertain a motion to adopt F-3-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1
34, Fire and Emergency Preparedness Drills Policy. So moved. Seconded. Okay. Is there any uh, discussion on this? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Uh, policy F34 is adopted. Um, move on to entertain a motion to adopt F35 access control and visitor management policy. I make a motion to approve the F35. Access control and visitor management policy. I'll second. Okay, any discussion? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. F35 is adopted. Okay, on to the discussion items. Uh, Start with a draft number one of student support budget. So I'll just start off with giving some background on the numbers <coughs> and then I will let your building administrators talk about the actual FTEs and the, the positions. So we won't know until the end of this month, beginning of November, what the rates are for health insurance that are going to be filed with the Department of Financial Regulations. So based on conversations that we've had um, throughout the last couple of months with our VHI representatives, they are anticipating a substantial increase due to the increase in medical claims, the increase of cost for medical services. So last year, as you recall, the increase was 12.7% filed. So I started at a 13% starting point for this year on the health and a 5% increase on the dental insurance. As far as staff that we use to build your budget for 25, we take the current staff and their benefits and that's what we use as the base to build your next year's budget. So the staff that are reflected as current staff is as of September 25th of 2023. So it's the staff that you have as of that day and the benefits that they had is what is used to build this first draft of your budget. And then I will turn it over to the other three. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> So the principal and admin section is un unchanged. Um, intervention section is changed just to reflect the actual, and it's not actually a, a proposed change. It's just a more accurate reflection of what's happening. Uh, guidance is unchanged. Uh, the school counselor secretary is something Jeff will talk about. Do you want us to pause and talk now, or do you want me to uh, keep busting through it? Go through it. Okay. I'll talk later. Uh, nurse is unchanged. Regular paras is unchanged. And it looks it looks like a lot, but I just want to remind everybody that it includes our preschool paraeducators, which I think is really important to note that we have to have them because of the ratio. And because we have four preschool classrooms, we have or preschool parents. Um, subs, as Tara indicated, is just to match the actuals. Um, MTSS student support, um, what we wanted to propose was the addition of one. Uh, right now, there's a designated one for the middle school, there's a designated one for the high school, and there's a designated support person for elementary. And um, I'm just going to launch it and talk about it. And I just, it's a, it's a struggle for me sharing that person across two campuses and me across two campuses. So that um, is just a proposal. Uh, co curricular directors, I believe that's just really what is actually happening. And then pathway and capstone, that's actual. And SAP counselor was in a small increase. Is that accurate? That's high school. Huh? Mm -hmm. okay. Anyways. So I don't know if you want to do questions first or if you want to <coughs> Excuse me. what Jeff wants to say about. Yeah, so I, I wrote down some uh, administrative assistant counseling mm -hmm. service job description, so I can just pass that around. Um, and with our increased enrollment, I think, and with our, um, our counselor trying to do a lot of different tasks, 
Uh, I just feel like he's very he's not able to. I don't think counsel well. Uh, he hasn't like been able to um, meet with seniors or juniors to prepare for college or for uh, life after high school. And he, it's he's done the scheduling and he's, he's his task is more than just a counselor. And some of the role that we're asking him to do is m more um, administrative as stuff than just counseling. And I feel that with an assistant in that position, our recruiting would go up. And if uh, you look at our numbers at the high school right now, the senior class is fairly small, like 40. And then it goes to 60, 70, 70. And I just feel that increase is really a pressure in the counseling office in itself. Um, and so to do the recruiting, to do the testing, I mean, we just did the PSAT testing and the different types of testing that we do throughout. Um, this person could be a great recruiter for us, which, you know, we go to Chelsea, we go to, I'm asked to go to uh, Stratford, and then other schools in our district, as far as, and as well as other schools. We do our Wildcat night. I just think this, this person would be able to assist in a lot of that extra work. And I don't want our students to miss out on opportunities. You know, that's always a, like, geez, we didn't miss, we missed that college visit and this college visit. You know, and a lot of our students have needs that, you know, a counselor needs to be with them for that. And I think this assistant could help out. Well, it's okay. early in the budget program, so I guess you're in for now, right? Yeah. Until <laughs> yeah. yeah. we, we get more numbers and, and see how everything yeah, we're, comes we're together, early. right? Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. All right, good. It's, <laughs> it's, it's funny that he you made the that first because cut. that's, that's yeah, what I was thinking. I'm, okay. like, I'm yeah. like, well, it's early, so. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to tell because, I mean, you just don't know what the rest of the budget looks like, but, I mean. <laughs> yes, if everything's up 11.9%, it might be difficult. But. Right. I mean, it, <laughs> it's, but I'm imagining so that other things aren't going to be, so. Just, it's one counselor doing all of that. Yeah. And, and you know, wow. let's just think of scholarships, you know, we're going to talk about the green and gold in a bit, but like, so that committee that he's in charge of to do just scholarships alone is just a lot of extra yeah. work. It's, and, you know, with all these new students coming in and the transcripts and working with transcripts and credits and it's a lot of work, yeah, right? Sure. The one thing for the board to know, and, it, and um, we'll continue to talk about this throughout, is that with the adjustments of the uh, long-range ADM weighting and the and the changes that the legislature made a few years ago. What act is it, Tara? You know, off the top of your head. Anyways, sure. it's the, yeah, <laughs> it's it's essentially how we've changed education funding to be to encompass the cost equity weighting model. And so, within your district, the agency right now is forecasting an increase of almost a hundred students in our weighting. And so we'll, those are preliminary numbers. These are the equalized pupils. Yes. All right. Yeah. So that's equalized pupil goes away. Oh, right. So, so that. But hurts, it's it's a, But it works the same way. It works the your same way. Factor. It's your dividing mm -hmm. factor. Yeah. yeah. It's to increase tax capacity. Um, that's not the case in all districts throughout the state. Um, I know another district north of us that has lost a hundred, and so um, they're mm -hmm. looking at like how are they gonna address those concerns so I will tell you that we are going to gain some capacity um, you know one of the things we're going to be monitoring closely is the revenue side of the budget as well I do our tuition is up which is good um, and so I think you know as we move forward you're gonna you're in, in next month you're gonna have all your FTEs which is a, a major driver for your budget you don't have tuitions <laughs> right so that that really drives about 80% of your budget um, and so next month we'll have a much better sense of where we at bottom line um, I just wanted to make certain I sorry I, I, I went to the bathroom but did, did we make certain we emphasize that this does provide a full-time reading and a full-time math interventionist at the middle school level was that mentioned licensed teacher I didn't mention it out okay. loud enough. so I just I want to make certain folks know that that is part of those 6.4 FTE um, is so that we, we, we do have a full-time reading and math at each elementary school and at your middle school. And it also encompasses some intervention at the high school. But just wanted to make certain folks knew that. 
I think the, I think the other thing we just have to be careful when we're going through the budget is, <clears throat> you know, we. I would anticipate that the yield go down significantly this Absolutely. year. Absolutely. As totally well as agree. you know the <clears throat> the state, you know the state's um, revenue from the feds on we'll call the COVID funds are drying up too. So there's a lot of holes in the state budget that that um, have not been figured out yet, which usually will weigh heavily on what that cost I per pupil is going to be. In the December 1st letter <clears throat> in the tax department. Yeah. So those will be some things that will be, you know, it's probably some things are going up, some things are coming down. So it's, yep. you know, where does it balance out at? Um, so yeah, it sugars out. When, when you made some adjustments based upon um, substitutes, is that is that based upon the time in which we're using substitutes or is that, or did we have to do some monetary increases to stay with with recent um, pay gaps? So that gaps is your or? utilization in fiscal year 23. <clears throat> That's how much you paid substitute teachers. So that was what the increase was based on. Let's try to guess more in alignment over the last few years how, many, how much we've actually been using substitutes. Okay. Well, I guess <clears throat> so just We've bumped up, up the figure a little so, bit, but, but not, not much. So uh, I guess I'm trying to rephrase it. So is that more so on the time in which we're using subs yes. or is this hey we've had to go from a pick a number you know from it's time it's not that you we're know paying so much a day a to more. so much more a day because we couldn't attract anybody no, i guess quantity of substitutes <clears throat> you are utilizing is driving that number okay and and then the sap counselor piece <clears throat> so the the notes say it was covered in grant funding in the FY 23. And sorry, the 24. It's both years we've covered that under our federal, our extra federal money, and that goes it's away. It's going away. Okay, yeah. I just want to make sure that was kind of. So that needs to go into the local budget to maintain that service. And that's not even covering all of it. We'll use some, yeah, yeah some other funding to cover some of what you have for SAPs, but it's to bring at least one of them in. And and how does that? How does that item look going forward in other budgets? So, you know, we're losing a portion, or we're having to fund a portion. Of, it sounds a portion of that this year, but how will that look in the next three so to five years? It will depend on federal funding in the future for us as a supervisory union. Our Medicaid funding, our MAC EPDST funding, which is based on services, which currently is covering some of those services throughout our SU. So it'll depend on what the feds decide to do with Medicaid if we'll be able to continue what quant what level <clears throat> the SU can continue to fund that service for our schools because these are always the challenges that we have is you know we had we've had lots of funding that has been pumped into um, government over the last X amount of years and now that That's funding right. starting to go away and so that clip's gonna happen. right so are these I mean, things that we've anticipated? Th these are not COVID funds I mean these are Medicaid <clears throat> funds that are pretty predictable yeah I mean, I would say that the need for mental health is significant, and, you know, we're trying to continue to leverage our Medicaid funding and, and other MAC health awareness type funding to support some of that. Um, and, you know, frankly, we adjust it based on, you know, the interdependence of the SU, I think, is such as we've tried to do budgeting more so to say, like, you know, when we have a district that's in a real tough financial spot, we may leverage some more of those federal funds as an SU to help support them um, and adjust that accordingly. So, you know, when we look at the revenue side of the budget, when the board gives us a, like a target to hit, right, on tax rate, we'll adjust revenues based on trying to make certain we best accommodate all the different districts in the SU with those funds. <clears throat> Certainly with the COVID funds, we've been consciously not funding long-term things. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're pretty much all built in at this point. Well, I just, when it said grant funding, so sometimes... And that was not COVID. Sometimes yes, you take grant funding and you have a commitment there, even though the funds run out in year three, let's say. <clears throat> this so is us trying to like actually that. get some things in the local districts that's been being covered by Medicaid and MAC funds to... Um, so that we don't get into a position where that funding goes away and then we just lose it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> OK, 
Okay, well, it's a good start. Guess we'll see how things shape up over the next, next little bit. Any uh, further comments on the initial student support budget draft? Thank you, Tara and Jamie. All right, so for the agenda for the board retreat, um, Jamie and I just did kind of a brief discussion over email. Um, and we kind of identified four basic topics that we'll try and cover. Um, so it's going to be from 6 to, did we say 8.30, is it? So we're going to aim for that for um, this Thursday. Um, we'll start out with the meal. Um, and so if everybody wants to bring a dish to share, um, I guess we probably could. I probably don't have time to do a brisket Thursday. Oh, come on, Rodney. <laughs> Sorry. And if not, I can always get food. You want to just get yeah, something? Yeah, Okay. That would certainly be easier for me. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> and where right. is the location for the event? Is it? At the SU office. At the SU, oh, that's SU? right. Yeah. And did you say 6 o'clock? <clears throat> yes. Oh, okay. Because it said 5.30. Yeah, so we pushed it back just a little bit. Good. That's good for me. Um, yeah, Peggy? Okay, I was going to say, I will try my best to get there, but believe it or not, we're trying to do fourth cut hay on Thursday. So I don't know exactly when my life will be my own, but I will do my best to get there. Okay. <coughs> All right. Um, Oops, sorry. Cancel that. <laughs> Um, so the four things that we talked about, I'm going to pull it up. Um, one was uh, kind of an overview of um, the facilities planning um, that we kind of covered earlier. So going into that and looking at that holistically. Um, uh, the task force to eject, address stakeholder feedback on um, yeah. on the merger and what is working well, what needs further attention, and what ideas the community might have to strengthen our school districts. Um, so kind of getting that, an overview of how we want to structure that and getting the ball rolling on that um, would be one of the things. Um, another... And people can certainly, we can certainly either do these or, you know, if people have other ideas of things that would be good, you know, we can certainly figure out what makes most sense. Um, one other thing would be a discussion on how to increase community engagement and communication with the community, um, particularly looking at how to get people interested in participating on the board so that we don't have vacant seats in the future and, um, Ideally, you don't have everybody running unopposed every single time. Um, so increasing participation with the board and also interest in <coughs> running for yeah, running for the board. Well, if we solve that, I think there will be a lot of people interested to in know how we did it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You could probably make a well, career out of going <laughs> town to town. Oh, uh, yeah. Did, did you run last time? <laughs> so. Or were you... Yeah, right. You want? Yeah. Did you have anybody? No, no. no nobody's didn't. been opposed for he a didn't. long time. So. And we didn't even have anybody run the previous two. That's why. I well, the, you guys were short, and then yeah. I think they were all unopposed. So yeah. I didn't run one year, and nobody still ran again. No, still nobody ran against me. Yeah. <laughs> and I wasn't even running. <laughs> yes. So. And it was just an empty spot. But. Um. So, so that would be one thing? No, line. no, that's good. And then the last thing would be uh, looking at the board. SU board has adopted goals for the SU board. So taking a look at those board, go board goals and how we as a district can um, further those goals. And if there's any district-specific things we would want to add for our own goals. So those are kind of what we threw out as, as ideas for what to try and cover during the <coughs> board retreats. If anybody has any other things that... I think we should focus on or so in regards to the facility planning piece of it is there anything that the board would like to see that I can get ready ahead of time uh, you know the the theater and music 
And I, I had said this to Jamie when he caught me in passing in a parking lot. Um, I, I'm fully, I fully support it, but I want, I want them to do it right. So when we're getting the funding, like if this happens in 2025, this is going to be their, this is going to be their shot until like 2037. Like this is so do it once, do it right, and 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 get it reasonable, mm -hmm. because. Um, Again, just in passing, somebody said to me, oh, it's not going to have any seating the way they did it. And I have saw nothing. And so, I mean, maybe you have. I said, it's just going to be a practice room and there's not going to be any seating to put on a concert. I said, well, that's, that's not as great as what I first en envisioned. Mm. Um, but for the kind of yeah, money I mean, it's not that a you're performance space. It's a, a practice, practice space. space. I know. So what I want them to say is that they understand that you know this is your practice space. Five years down the road, we might not be able to fund a performance space, and we don't have a performance space in. Yeah, I mean, the I think district. We we don't have a theater. We have the the gym right. where we yeah. set up chairs. And um, has there ever been any talk of? Of a small theater for the both the band and 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 the theater kids where there was uh chairs mm. to sit and put on a play and for the band to go up on the stage <coughs> and for maybe yes. holding assemblies and is this one is this our chance if you will to 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 build something of that magnitude for that kind of money where there's uh what'd you say seventy per class so to a couple hundred seats, um, yeah. and that's that's all. I mean, I guess it's I'm on I'm on both sides, but I really really mm -hmm. love that. But I also need to say that like five years down the road, if I'm still on this board, we can't be going back to the well and mm -hmm. and doing that. So like, what what do we want? How are we going to fund it? And let's make sure that if we shoot, let's shoot for the stars. I had no idea that you said they they had that much money committed. So. Yeah, $3 million for a practice space? Well, it, it's to redo the front entry. Yeah, it's to, to do, do it. some improvements in the small gymnasium that we use as our performance space. Yeah. And uh, there is the to stage improve there. improve acoustics. Yeah. Um, and, and possibly, like, it was really to re-outfit it to make it more multi-purpose. Multi. And two different rehearsal spaces off the front. But and it gets it aligned better with, you know inside the building so they don't have to truck from one side of the building which is in the basement to the other side of the building right. which is you know a whole level one way to think about it nancy's new construction <laughs> is 18 months ago it was about 620 dollars a foot yeah um and so you know you're looking at probably almost 20 percent more than that so um it doesn't take much to add up yeah. to to millions. I mean, in another district right now, we're looking at just adding five classrooms and doing some mm -hmm. changes within the existing framework, and it, we're looking at about a ten million dollar bond. Wow. But I, but I can probably what I was getting to is I could, you yeah. know, I could probably I know we have some prelim drawings for that. We do. We could. We as should well win. as I can, I can talk to Eric about setting me some of the additional information of kind of. That. Only could, well one because I'm curious. I really am. Sure. But. Yeah. So we can put get that for it. Yeah, be good. And I think just having something that kind of summarizes all the different things we're looking at so we can kind of look at it all together and, you know, maybe try and put together some sort of a timeline or idea of a timeline, not, nothing sure. specific, yep. but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. like, Chris, I can work on something probably Thursday morning and I'll share it okay. with you. We can keep adding to it. I feel the need to mention that embedded in the principal report was the enrollment numbers, and that 70 that was mentioned is just like a, a bump. Like, not all classes are 70 going forward. So just 80, 90, 80, 90. 90. <laughs> 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 They're more around 40. Yeah. No, but I would take the high school. I mean, our recruitment is getting yeah, some of the high yeah. school numbers up. It looked look like the numbers were pretty, pretty good, other than there was like a lull in the. Sixth grade class maybe was, I think, grade small grade. right now, forty something, yeah. forty five or whatever. Yeah. Forty seven, forty one. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I mentioned this, but it is important for the board to know it's the first time 
I bet you in a very, very long time that um, we were able to have the most students chose your high school within one of our existing districts in the SU. That's um, great. You would, I'd like that to start to be our common conversation. <laughs> um, but that was an exciting celebration, I think, that, that we're mm -hmm. gaining. And, you know, I would say to you, and it's probably somebody I should talk about more at the SU board, I think there's, there's really three factors to that. One, the high school is doing a, a much better job at marketing itself. Two, I believe that there's true interdependence happening around, among our admin team, that we are seeing that, my, that our administrators are working together for the betterment of the SU. And part of that is, is making certain that our high school is, is getting a look in our middle school. And three, I would say that there's a real sense of the other district boards to want to promote your district. And as someone that you know grew up in Royalton and, and went through that school system and taught there, that, was not the, that has not been my impression. And so I do think at the full board level at some point as a district board here, we should let folks know that, that we're seeing that. Because um, you'd be surprised how many times your district comes up in our school choice board meetings now by board members voluntarily <laughs> talking about how we need to promote this district and why it's important that our kids uh, really look at staying within the SU umbrella. And, and there's also a good vibe you know, with the high school right now, and, and, and there are some area high schools that are struggling um, to, to attract students which are losing out of their district. So it's, I think it's just a great opportunity for us to capitalize on that. And we saw, you know, quite, quite a bit of new students come through into the high school this year that, from others. So. It's your next t-shirt there, Jeff. I know. Wildcats have good vibes. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> I was having to take that. <laughs> um, all right, back to the agenda. Do those kind of four guiding topics mm. try and spend about half an hour on each? Does that seem like a good agenda? Does anybody have anything else they'd like to bring up or potentially discuss? I have a logistical question. How many of us are there going to be at this retreat for, if we're going to be bringing food to share? Like, is it, ju <laughs> is it just the board members or is... It's all of us, but um, I said I would get catering. I'll, I'll get it catered. Oh, oh, okay. I, I missed that. <laughs> it, it, yeah, I said I couldn't barbecue this year, so they ah, hired it that's out. That's what, the, okay, I heard a little discussion going on over there. <laughs> yeah, uh, usually I, well, not usually, but a couple of times I've smoked uh, a brisket. And let's cook. Rodney said, I'm not going to cook. So <laughs> yeah. Jamie said, I'll just buy food if you're not going to cook. <laughs> it's so, tight, too. We're talking about two days. Yeah. And, and with... So we're just kind of going through here. So I'll get, we have the information for the facility planning that we'll get out to everybody. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the merger feedback portion of that, do, do we have the old um, um, plans for when the merger was going through of this was kind of the vision at that point? Sure. That we could share with the board so that we can Yeah, I mean, we have the, uh, <clears throat> the articles of agreement and the proposal that was sent to the state. You know, it is a little tricky because there was the multiple votes and so each right. you know the, there was the original plan that included Rochester and then things were adapt, mm -hmm. adapted to the Bethel one but at least we and could you know we do have you know newer members or, yep. or maybe just to get us yeah, up on on what that looked like at the time because other than you and Rodney right I mean you guys yep. were, <laughs> were, were the, everybody the else was that's new to that so that would be kind of helpful and I don't know um, um, should we get like leather jackets so you say we're original on them? <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, can we get a we uh, a copy of the the SU goals yes. again so we can look yep. at those? Um, um, do you have the? I'll get the SU goals in the merger agreement. Okay. Yep. Do you want to just email those out like? Yep. The next day or two. I can do those tomorrow. The other yep. one, it, we may be yeah right, coming right. you know with it. Great. Thank you, Jamie. Okay. Seems like we have a plan. Then uh, moving to the green and gold scholarship criteria. Yes, so, um, so this year, it's been the valedictorian at our school for years, and uh, 
Chris Kate and I were both new to the school, and uh, we got the UVM criteria, and we selected a candidate based on UVM's criteria, and it was not the valedictorian, and it had been past practice, so um, I spoke with the valedictorian and the parents and apologized for that um, kind of mess up, if you will, and it, instead we went with this criteria here, so we're moving forward with um, kind of like we do for all of our scholarships at our school when it comes to the graduation. Um, we have a, a small committee, and um, Chris works diligently. It was quite a task this year to have <laughs> to all these scholarships, and Chris is actually does an amazing job of finding more scholarships for our graduating class. And I, I forgot how much money was um, out there last year for our seniors. Um, but we kind of have a committee each, for each um, scholarship, and we had a committee for this green and gold scholarship, and so we set forth some criteria for that, and they, this is the criteria moving forward. That we'd like you to, to consider adopting. Yeah. If you sure. remember, we talked as a board back in, in March of 2021 about pro providing a proposal around criteria, and mm -hmm. we shared with you the Randolph version. Um, we're not recommending that um, version to you. We're recommending this because this has been vetted by UVM and given us the thumbs up. There were some concerns with the other version that we had shared with you at yeah, the fine. UVM level. Um, and then, you know, frankly, this should have came in front of you last fall, and um, you know I'll take ownership of dropping the ball. We had a new principal and new school counselor, and that didn't get in front of you. So we're bringing it in front of you to get ahead of the game now. So just being a little naive on the whole, is the UVM green gold criteria, is that because that's only applicable to a UVM campus, or? This so is this a scholarship that they provide okay. to a, one senior at every high school throughout the state. Gotcha, okay. And it's pretty much full boat, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it's full boat, um, other than there are some other fees in regards to books and things of that nature. It, it's tuition, okay. but yeah. it doesn't tuition. cover books or a house. Gotcha, yep. But um, you have to go to UVM. Yes. Yeah. 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 To UVM. Yeah. Um, so it says uh, administration counseling, student support coordinator, and senior advisor. Is there just one senior advisor or? It is Would one senior advisor, but that senior advisor talks to the staff with questions of this criteria for the candidates. So who is the senior advisor, I guess? Right like, now it's uh, Raina, um, Robbins, and Nalani Sutton. Okay. Yeah. All right. It would change. We'd yeah, it changes. It changes. Yeah. yeah. So it's basically whichever teachers are the advisor for the yeah. senior class. Got it. And uh, do we define a correct GPA? Yeah, UVM has that. It's okay. 3.7 or higher. Yeah, 3.7. And a college level course means like an AP course. Or yeah. A, yeah. Or it, honors. In honors or in honors. In students that go to BTC or Norwich as well, obviously. And how expansive is defining ex extracurricular activities? Uh, you know, we ask our athletic director, and we, we also, you know, know students by the end of the, you know. So athletics, the, theater, band. Yeah, yeah, and community service. Is community one, service. Yeah, extracurricular. Drama. Yeah. Um, that looks good to me. I don't have any problems with this. Mm. Do we need a motion on that? I would prefer... I mean, we don't, but I like to have it for the minutes so that if this, you know, let's say four years from now, we're all gone, and people are saying, well, why do you not just use the valedictorian? Right. That we can go back to the minutes and say, well, no, the board adopted a criteria that aligns with UVM's. We'll have uh, to um, make sure, like, the 11th grade parents get just notified. Yes. You know, the, not only that, you know, the, the board I mean, gets out. I, I may be naive, but... Doesn't that criteria have to exclude the valedictorian specifly because the, well, the valedictorian may not want to go to UVM? We can't choose the person based on that. 
UVM has. So it gets awarded to somebody, and then they decide that they're going to UVM. And what if they oh, no. don't go to UVM then and just they don't get to award this? They it just wasted. evaporates. Yep. Yeah. Most years it doesn't get used. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so I I think I'm. That's one thing that I do like is that it's opened up now to more individuals yeah. that qualify that, like Ed was saying, <laughs> that may use UVM more often than it has been used in the past. Right. So <laughs> you got a kid that just spent four years and wants to get into Yale. They get into Yale, but they win the UVM scholarship, and then yeah. it goes up in vapor. But then your salutorian or the fourth, fourth or fifth kid who's got a 3.95, wanted to go to UVM, could have used it, I think that yeah. that's not yeah, I great. Remember, I remember seeing all that when I was in high school, you know, some of the kids that got all the, all the money and where did they end up, right? So. At one point in time, they used to let the school go down because um, I know a kid that was number like four in her class and she, she ended up getting it from Woodstock. They started with the valedictorian, but the valedictorian didn't want it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you're not, that's, you're not yeah. allowed to I choose that. You can't <laughs> yeah. say, oh, this person can use it. Yeah. No, it's it, but they did it at one point in time yeah. because yeah. this kid yeah. did go to UVM yeah. with that's that scholarship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was 25 years ago. Yeah, so. <laughs> quite a bit less money at that time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> All right. Um, so I'd entertain a motion to adopt these green and gold scholarship criteria. I'll so make a motion. Oh, oh. Second it. Okay. Except Moved by yeah, Rodney, seconded by Nancy. Um, add that to the handbook, Andrew. Yep, have it in our handbook. Great idea. Yeah, yeah all right. right now. Yep. All in favor? Aye. aye. Say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? All right. Those are adopted. Um, is there any public comments? Hi, this is Tammy. Um, so I'm learning some things here, and because I'm the general public. Um, can you really combine bond votes for different projects when there's grant-funded dollars and donor-funded dollars? Yes. Yes. Okay. And where did the one-third and two-third numbers come for the music project? Why not half and half or two-thirds and one-third? I, I think when we, well, when we were presented by, well, it's been an idea for, I don't know, a decade or more. More. Um, I know when it was revisited with our committee, and then we had talked about it briefly at the um, at the school board, that you know try to to get it to be attractable to the community. We kind of came up with a informal criteria, just saying, hey, we're going to need some donor money or some outside money to to um, to make this attractive if we did go to a bond vote, and we just kind of threw out a third at that point, not knowing. I don't even think we even knew how much the the upgrades to the facility would even cost at that point, but we just kind of said a third, um, and and then just kind of let them uh, try to lo line up uh, donors um, for that. So it, it doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that at the end of the day it could be funded more than a third, um, but that was just kind of a target we had thrown out there for the conversation. Okay, and then um, at the board, at the report retreat, you guys are going to talk on preliminary information. Um, you know what the preliminary component is, um, and there was mention of a performance space versus a practice space. And generally speaking, the performance space that the community has come to recognize is, is either one gym at the elementary school or the other gym at the high school, and so. This music project is not looking to replace that deemed performance space, is it? No, no. It's it would be fixing up okay. the stage in the elementary school, providing practice space off of that, and maybe you know helping with acoustics. And yeah, like acoustics that. storage okay. for seating and stuff like that. Major okay. realignment, you know, just safer access because there's a lot of there was safety concerns and things like that that were raised as well okay um and we'll see that when we see our november musical i believe it's november is that right um it certainly would not then, be by november <laughs> we wouldn't be seeing it by november no now this would be no, I, um, yeah. our, 
yeah, that they would probably present I something about that. Yeah, got it. Our music of 23, not at this future space. Yeah. I was just getting a plug-in for the music folks. Um, and then um, Jamie identified this is the first time to have the most students in, select our high school. Um, and that was attributed to improved marketing, interdepartmental um, relationships. In interdependence, yeah. Okay, uh, interdependence, yes. And then a sense of other district boards promoting um, the White River High School. Um, are there other community factors impact acting? Students leaving other supervisory unions and coming to our supervisory unions, you, our, our high school, that we're aware of? It's a really abstract question, and I'll call yeah. that out. You know, you're, you're good. I, I wouldn't say that they're leaving other supervisory unions. I would say it's our kids choosing to stay within our umbrella. The, the only place where we're gaining kids from other supervisory unions is typically through Winooski Valley School Choice, because we don't, other than Echo Valley, which is a district just north of Chelsea, it's Washington Orange, we don't really have any school choice districts near us. Um, and so, what it, it can be is through a Winooski Valley School Choice, and what I, what I would say is we have more students entering our high school from Winooski Valley than leaving. It's pretty significant. It's, it's about almost three to one. Um, and they are, most of those students are coming to us currently right now from Randolph. I was expecting this answer. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Peggy? Okay, I was going to speak as public parent. I'm looking towards, I guess, probably next year's budgeting or whatever, transportation for students who are involved in athletics. Because I'm looking, I'm wondering how many students from, who live in South Royalton, are not able to play sports because they don't have the transportation to come home after practice. Or students from Bethel who would like to participate in high school sports but don't have transportation to get home after practices. And I would just like to see us look at that because I'm looking at my, my granddaughter playing soccer this year and because I can't pick her up right afterwards because of chores, I have to depend on her being able to go to other people's houses, other friends' houses, and sometimes it doesn't work. And so she's kind of been, you know, sometimes her coach has stayed with her afterwards, but I, it would really be nice if you know there are specific times that practice is over them to help provide transportation for those sort of things. So Peggy, I, something I, to think about. Well, no, I appreciate you raising this, and I'll meet with our activities directors. I mean, we are, we have public transportation happening later now to provide some transportation. So my hope was practices were being aligned to that better. So it's something we'll yeah, look I, into. I, yeah, I mean, they, they have transportation for kids involved in right after school things, but that, that ends quicker than practice does. Well, right. So I'm curious. Right. And sometimes that's driven by coaches, which I get. Um, but yes, thank you for raising it. It's something where we continue to try to address and we try to do it some via public transportation. Although I do wonder sometimes, though, are we meeting on the activity act on the athletic side reminding ourselves that public transportation is there and we should be best trying to accommodate schedules to make certain kids that need rides can use it since we've got it and i don't know if we're prioritizing that necessarily so i think it's it's worthwhile to to look into it again thank you no thank you okay Unless there's any other public comment, we'll move on to new hires, resignations. None. None? That's good this time of year. Yeah. Uh, we are not doing the executive session personnel, so we don't have any other. Um, 
future agenda items there was we need to still appoint a member to the finance committee um, and our next meeting is going to be the board retreat this Thursday six o'clock at the SU office and then our next official meeting is that's in person only correct yes yeah I just want to make certain the board I was saying it just to make certain everyone knew Tuesday November, this one that we're reading right now is in person. Thursday. Thursday. No, 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 Thursday. Thursday. Oh, Thursday is. Oh, all right. Yeah. I'm like, that's weird, but okay. <laughs> oh, no, Thursday. Cool. Yeah. Um, and the next regularly scheduled meeting is Tuesday, November 21st, 7 p.m. at Royal Tink Campus. I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Seconded. All right. Thanks, everybody. I do know um